Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us tonight. If it's your first night with us, welcome. We're happy you're here with us. We know you all had very busy days, so um, we really appreciate you spending an hour with us in the evening and learn a little bit about the budget. Um, tonight, we have James Moses with us again from Child Care Resource Center, and he's also our Region 10 ECE Voices Lead Advocate. Um, he's going to be talking more about the budget with you tonight. Uh, we covered it a couple weeks ago, the overall process. He'll do a short summary of that and then kind of get into more of the nitty gritty of how it affects the ECE world and how subcommittees work. Um, if at any time you have questions, please use the Q&A box that you see, the little icon. You can click on that and put any questions you want in there, and we'll do our best to answer you either out loud so everyone can hear or we'll just type a response in there. Feel free to use the chat box to chat amongst yourself and um, don't hesitate to raise your hand or use your icon to raise your hand to ask us any questions that you might have along the way. We will have um, a Q&A at the end. We also will have um, all of this available for you to see, um, including the same slideshow with more detailed information on our resources page, which will go out in an email after the training. So at this point, I'm going to pass it on over to James and let him start um, to teach you about the budget. Thank you, Justina, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, happy to have you here. I think, uh, you know, before we get started, just want to remind folks about the work we're doing at EC Voices, and Justina is leading us in that work, and so this is a statewide uh, opportunity for us to build advocacy capacity specifically with our ECE practitioners. So we really are trying to reach the teachers, the site supervisors, family child care providers, help them understand you know, what advocacy is, how they can participate in it, make sure that we provide training, coaching, mentoring that helps them feel comfortable and qualified to go out and advocate either locally in their region or for some, perhaps even come up to Sacramento and be involved in hearings and, and testify. So I encourage you, if you're not already connected in your EC Voices region, reach out to Justina. Uh, let's make sure we get you signed up and connected. Um, we we have, uh, this is the end of the first series of trainings. Justina's already got a second set that you'll hear about. Um, set up and ready to go to really provide much more in-depth uh, resources and information around advocacy uh, specific. So we look forward to have you joining us and, and be a bigger part of this. So um, if you have any questions related to that, let us know. We'll get you. We'll get you connected. So we're going to start with a summary here. Um, so hopefully, many of you were with us a couple of weeks ago. We went a lot in a lot more detail around the budget summary, I mean, around the budget, I really outlined how it how it gets put together, who's involved in, in all the pieces more in detail. But just a, a quick summary, if you weren't with us, um, we just want to identify kind of the timeline of what happens, right? So late summer, in, primarily in the fall, really, the Department of Finance and the, and the governor really start to, and the departments start to prepare their department budgets. They connect with the Department of Finance. They work with the, the governor and the governor uh, then prepares a budget that he releases every year in January. So the governor releases that budget in January. At that point, you know, many people are evaluating, analyzing that budget, and then weighing in, um, uh, giving their perspective. So both the Assembly and the Senate do this. The Legislative Analyst's Office do it. The departments look at uh, his budget summaries. All of us advocates take a look at his budgets. We take a look at the documents that are provided by LAO, Department of Finance. We look at entities you know, every child California puts out um, kind of our our perspective of the budget and what's included. We talk about what how we might need to advocate related to that. The California budget um, project, they give us information. So everybody's weighing in and giving input. Ultimately, what happens is the assembly and the Senate have 
they meet around the, they take all that information into consideration. There's a lot of budget committee meetings, and then they provide their budget recommendations. The governor takes those informa that information into account. He releases a May revise in May. And then we kind of go through that process that I just quickly outlined. That whole process happens again, but very quickly, really with just about a month. So between the May revise and June 15th, when the Assembly and Senate, the legislature needs to uh, approve a, a budget and submit it over to the governor, the, they have 30 days. But that whole process kind of happens uh, in, in that 30 days all over again. It's just um, very compacted. And then the governor takes that in, information into hand. And generally, in the last, you know, quite a few years, the governor has always had a budget signed and ready to go uh, before July 1st. Uh, the July 1st deadline is not, there's no law or rule around that July 1st. So we have, in years past, we used to have many instances where the, the final budget wouldn't be signed and approved. Sometimes we'd go into uh, early fall before we would see a budget fully approved and signed by the governor. What has changed a little bit now is that the legislature must approve their budget by June 15th. If that budget's not approved by June 15th, then um, the legislators yeah. don't get paid. And so that's, <clears throat> that's expedited this process to some degree as well. So we'll move to the next slide and I'm not gonna really go in depth on the next slide here. We, we went more in depth in the last training, but this infographic kind of outlines the process in a little bit more detail. It's basically a lot of it is what I just explained. Um, so this is just available to you as we move forward. Um, when you go to the resources, you'll have this, um, this document available to you, but this document kind of walks you through the process of how we get to a, a finalized budget. So moving to the next slide, some of the things we'll be talking about um, as we go through this training today, we'll be talking about the budget bill. Um, we'll also be talking about budget related bills, a uh, little bit about the budget bill junior, trailer bills. We'll also talk a lot about the fiscal and budget subcommittees. So um, we'll go into to detail, but there's budget subcommittees and full budget committees on both the assembly and the Senate side. We'll talk a little bit about how those committees and subcommittees work. We'll talk a little bit also about how you can get involved in advocating um, in those committees, as well as where you might find information that would that would help um, educate you and inform you on on that advocacy work. So if we move into the next slide. This is on the assembly side. So what you see here is uh, you know at the top of this is um, a, a screenshot of it of what the website actually looks like. So when you get your final resources, uh, Justina sends those out to you. The link here in the, the PowerPoint, this will take you to this uh, assembly budget committee page. And um, that page, is that me or is that? That's me, I'm showing um, what it okay. looks like. So each of these clickable links, I'll go out to the page for a little bit for them to see it. Perfect. So. Um, we'll provide, we'll be providing you a little more detail, but you, you start on the committee homepage and then you can go in and see who the members of the full budget committee are. You can take a look at the subcommittees, see what the subcommittees are, who their members are, who the staff is. We're going to walk through that. Um, but all the information around their hearing dates, their times, uh, where they're located, also, most of the time, and Nina maybe can add to that, it, it may be all of these meetings are now also accessible virtually. So often, if you know, it used to be if you couldn't be there in person, you couldn't testify. Now, um, all these meetings are virtual. You have the ability to join the meeting via Zoom. You can also provide testimony via Zoom. They give us a phone number and you can provide testimony that way. Um, 
so this is a this is a great page. This page, as well as other links to other other pages that provide you information uh, or in locations where you can go to access information around the budget. Um, that'll be provided for you as well. Let's go ahead and we'll move on to the next slide. So what we're what you're seeing here, this is a list of all the members that are part of the uh, assembly budget committee. Now, some of these folks may be part of uh, subcommittees, the, the budget subcommittees as well, but this is the full assembly budget committee. And Justine has included a link that will help you find your representative. So, you know, for most of us, what I think is really important for us is to take a look at this budget committee group of legislators and for us to identify which of these leg legislators are serving their districts is uh, in, in the area where our program location is or our classroom sites are. Um, so for example, on the assembly side here, I, I may end up having communication with Jesse Gabriel's office as the chair, you know, there's also budget committee staff. And so we get connected to those budget committee staff and especially our folks in Sacramento, um, Nina, for example, um, but CCRC, my organization, we have Sacramento folks. They're very connected to the budget committee staff. That's where a lot of information is comes from. That's a great uh place for advocacy. So our folks that are in Sacramento provide a lot of direct advocacy and have regular communication daily to weekly to daily with the staff of the budget committee. But for many of us that aren't in Sacramento regularly, for me, I go through this list and I, I focus on the San Bernardino County elected officials first. So I have, you know, Eloise Gomez Reyes is part of the budget committee. Uh, James Ramos, part of the budget committee. So they're in my district. I have really good relationships with their district staff. So when when we talk about what our budget needs are, when we meet and identify what those are, we share that information out to all of you so you can begin to advocate locally um, with your elected officials. Now, and then for me, we also, my organization also serves Northern LA County. So I may be connecting with some of those folks in, in LA County, Laura Friedman, Eduardo uh, Garcia on the Riverside County, um, Dr. Corey Jackson, Sabrina Cervantes. These are folks that are in Riverside County and I have relationships there. So when you see these lists, take a look at the legislators that are serving the areas where your, your work locations are or you live you are a constituent of theirs. They are very interested in hearing from you about what your concerns about the budget are. Now, one of the things that we will make sure we provide you um, in within the resources, when, when the budget comes out and we start weighing in on the budget, Every Child California puts out regular communication to all of the members of Every Child California as well as right now, all of our EC Voices Network members that have signed up will receive that information. So when we provide that information, we give you kind of all the budget information. We give you often some analysis on the budget information, our perspectives related to that budget information. And then often we have advocacy um, like advocacy um, steps that we that we share with you that you can take. If you're interested in weighing in on the budget, here's the steps you can take. So it may be template letters. It may be a sign-on letter. It may be information about reaching out, making a phone call or an email to your district uh, representative. So it's very important on the budget side, when you see these lists, to take a look at who your representative it, representative is and make sure you're getting connected with the representative that serves your, your area. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Just in so what we're showing you here is um, to just give you a little bit of a sense of the full budget committee, what their schedule looks like. 
So the dates that are in here, this is what just transpired this, this year of 2023. Now, these dates are going to look different each year. There could be more or less meetings each year, depending on what's in the budget, um, who's weighing in on the budget, um, you know, what the committee member schedules are like. But uh, typically what we see is after the governor releases that January budget, we see the full budget committee. And keep in mind, this is only the full budget committee hearings on the assembly side. At the same time that these meetings are happening, each subcommittee, each subcommittee is having a number of meetings like this as well. That ultimately the information, they take in information, they analyze it, they evaluate it, they, they uh, report that back to the full budget committee. But this gives you an idea a little bit of how that rolls. And what you'll see is that the, the governor's January budget is, is issued and rolled out. And then for a few months, we they have monthly meetings typically. These, these may go even as late as April, where they're analyzing the, the, the budget, trailer bills um, in that budget. And then we go into the May revise. So that information comes back, all, the legislature weighs in, provides a, a budget to the governor before the May revise, he issues the May revise, and then you see that process kind of starts up again, it, you know, starting in June. And so then the full budget committee is analyzing the budget packages, they um, have hearings, we'll talk a little bit more about that. We are active in hearings for the subcommittees that are related to to our program areas, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But this gives you an example of what the schedule looked like in this last um, calendar year for the assembly, assembly Budget Committee. Now, what you're seeing now is the same thing. I'm not gonna spend as much time on this, but this is the Senate Budget Committee pages. So this is very similar to the Assembly Budget pages. Um, everything, just everything you need related to the budget and what the legislature is doing, you're, you can find here. So you're going to be able to find the links to all of the, the daily files. You're going to be able to find the links to the committee members, the budget subcommittees, um, what the hearing dates are, what the get connected to the agendas. If you want to attend virtually, the virtual notifications are there. You can you know, th this site will get you connected to all of those virtual meetings uh, or virtual hearings, right? And then you have, of course, a, a huge archive of information. So if you if you go on there after this meeting today, you, you go and you can see the archive of all the meetings that they've held, you know, o over time and, and what those what those meetings look like. Now that, yeah, this slide shows you the Senate. Now what you'll typically notice is there's, keep in mind that we have 80 assembly members, we have 40 senators. So typically speaking, um, there could, there, there generally is a few less people on the Senate budge, budget committee than there are on the assembly budget committee. Um, they do have a few less budget subcommittees, and we'll take a look at that in just a moment. Um, but they they run through the same process. So, you know, what happens in the assembly, it happens very similarly in the Senate. They go through um, largely the, the very same process. Um, and you can see how they set up their hearings after the governor uh, issued his budget in January. So a little bit different, right? In, in the assembly side, we saw meetings January, February, March, they held meetings. And I honestly can't remember back on those, but those meetings, for example, could have been an hour long. They could have been six hours long. Um, each, each house of the legislature can set up their budget committee meetings a little different. So you see here, there was a real heavy emphasis in these meetings in in February, right after the governor released his budget. And you could see, you know, this year there was um, 
a lot of attention in our in our child care and ECE uh, world. So we had a lot of opportunity um, for input and a lot of hearings were focused on um, on our area of, of funding. So the same kind of process right after May, the governor releases that May revise, they go they go back and it's a, it's abbreviated, but between May and the finalization of the budget, they go through that process again. And then when the governor releases his final budget, there's still hearings and they're still having committee meetings because there's additional um, budget trailer bill language comes out. So that's why you'll see meetings often after the legislature has approved their budget. There continues to be meetings that are related to uh, budget trailer bills, cleanup language related to the budget, uh, language that says, okay, this was approved. You know, the, the governor approved this in his budget, but now we're having hearings and meetings to determine exactly how that money will be allocated when it will be allocated, when it needs to be expended by. So there'll be additional hearings that start to outline some of the specifics related to that information. And I think on the next page, yeah, we have the, the Senate Budget Committee. As I outlined the, um, in the assembly, they have their subcommittees the Senate has their subcommittees as, as well. And you'll see it, there's a few less subcommittees on the uh, Senate side than there are on the, the assembly side. One of the changes that's happening starting this, this legislative year is on the assembly side, those first two subcommittees, sub one and sub two, those used to be together. So that both of those were sub one. And many of our many of our issue areas were heard in the Health and Human Services Subcommittee. But there's so many issue areas that end up falling falling in those two areas that this year the um, the leader of the assembly decided to break those out into into two separate subcommittees. So for the most part we will be, and I actually think this might be listed on the next slide if I'm remembering right, Justine, I think she broke this down. So most of our issues um, are heard, will be heard in the Human Services Subcommittee and the edu Education Subcommittee in both houses. Um, you'll see that the Senate still has Health and Human Services together. And as I mentioned, I don't know that this is the reason. Nina may have inside information and know that, but as I, as I mentioned, the assembly has 80 members, the Senate has 40. And so sometimes the challenge for the Senate, if they, even if they wanted to expand, you know, move health and human services into two subcommittees is the bandwidth of enough members. So sometimes that, um, I don't know, I don't know if it's fair to say that it limits them, but certainly how they approach some of their work differentiates um, because of the fact that there's 80 members in the assembly and only 40 in the Senate. So one thing I do want to point out when you, when you go to the assembly and Senate um, websites that, that Justina has linked, those, four budget subcommittees, two in each house, each of those subcommittees, you can click on each of those subcommittees, see who the subcommittee members are for, for the human services and for the education. I, I would also encourage all of you to take a look at who those members are and identify whether any of those members are in, in your service area. They they're, they are, you're a constituent of them. So in, in the last couple of years on the human services side and education side, we've had several folks, uh, legislators from San Bernardino and Riverside that have been part of those committees. So it's important to look at the subcommittee members and identify which, which of those are serving you. Um, so you can really target your advocacy work towards them and communication with them. So this um, 
this talks a little bit, you know, we talked before about the, the January budget proposal and the, the May revise, right? And we've right now we talked a lot about the legislature's role in that in that. And this just is giving you um, a little bit of a sense of of who who is part of that, right? So um, the LAO's office does a review of the budget and, and provides documentation and analysis related to their perspective of the governor's budget. The Department of Finance works with the departments as they prepare budgets. They work with the departments in response to the governor's budget, you know, related to adjustments they need to make. So um, they are reviewing documents sometimes before they go into the governor and, and after they've left the, the governor, right? And then <clears throat> the the various entities, like you said, in addition to the LAOs, we have a lot of um, advocacy groups that review that budget and provide analysis of that budget. A lot of uh, us, like our membership organizations, like Every Child California, we work in concert with some of those advocacy groups and, and through that budget analysis and, as, and then in, in conjunction, we use that information to really create our um, kind of our path, our advocacy path in response to the governor's budget proposals. And so we take all that money, um, I mean, all that money, all that information um, into consideration. We work with other advocate uh, agencies to really start to kind of forge that path of how should we advocate um, when we look at the EC Coalition, which Every Child California is a, a member of the EC Coalition, I'd say um, not just a member, but a, a key member that provides a lot of guidance and direction within the EC Coalition as well. So that e broader California EC Coalition really takes a look at that budget it gets analyzed with those partners, almost all of which are part of the EC coalition. And then together, we look at that advocacy path that's necessary and needed. That's often uh, broken out. And, and there's a strategic plan of how we're going to advocate with legislators and with the governor's office. We look at that both how we're going to advocate in Sacramento and how we're going to advocate locally. So some membership organizations, we're one of those. We have the benefit and the ability to advocate in Sacramento directly with the legislators, the governor's office in Sacramento. But we also have a really good um, ability to advocate in the local offices and make sure that the elected officials understand how these budget implications will impact their local community. So that really gives us a, uh, from an advocacy perspective, in some ways that gives us a little bit of an advantage, not only to be going into Sacramento where, where the work, a lot of the key work on this is happening, but to come back in their local district where they live and say, this is how this, is how this budget is gonna impact us. If this passes this way, then this many families are gonna learn, lose services to state preschool. If this passes this way and we don't waive family fees or make an adjustment to family fees, then we're gonna see this many families who risk losing their early childhood uh, subsidies or childcare subsidies. So it really gives us an opportunity to advocate at the state level, but also, like I said, locally where things are happening in their, in their district areas. Um, and then we've really outlined the subcommittees and the, and the work they do. So I don't, I think we can move to the next slide, Justina. So here, what we're hoping to do, and we have a, um, we have an infographic that you'll get after this. Um, and the infographic is, um, it was just so long, we had, we had it in several slides. But what we want you to, to see and kind of get a sense of is a little bit about how the funding streams work for us, right? So 
a great deal of our funding comes down from the federal government. So a big piece of it comes, well, almost all of it comes from at the federal level from the Health and Human Services Department, right? And they they operate a number of programs, maybe as many as a hundred different programs from a federal level perspective. So Head Start funding comes out of Health and Human Services. So um, most of the Head Start com funding uh, comes from Health and Human Services. Head Start, much of that goes directly to uh, to the Head Start program, the grantees. But there is Head Start funding that comes into the state level, and we do have a, a state level department dedicated towards uh, Head Start collaboration office. Um, so money comes in for Head Start. Also through Health and Human Services, we have all the CalWORKs funding. So this is, um, you know, the CalWORKs funding for TANF funding. Um, and uh, But connected to that is the child care funding, right? The stage one, stage two, stage three. In addition, we have the alternative payment program funding, but all the, you know, CCTR, much of the migrant funding, some of the funding um, for fetch-in programs, a lot of uh, that program funding also comes down through health and human services as well. So these, these come down, as they come down into the state level, they all come down through CDSS. That's who regulates uh, this funding for us at the state level. So that's the federal funding that comes in. In addition to that, we have state funding. So we you've probably heard us talk a lot about Prop 98. So Prop 98 is a lot of the education funding. In, in our world, our state preschool funding all is Prop 98. Um, our T, the TK you know, transitional kindergarten funding is Prop 98. Some of the, or I think really more much of the money that's come out related to UPK, so the workforce development money, um, planning grants, those type of things, that's all come out of Prop 98 as well that we've seen in recent uh, years. And there's pros and cons to being, you know, in and out of Prop 98, in, at least in the years that I've been involved with this, there were times that more of our programs were in Prop 98 and then some went out and some went back in. And then for the most part now, none of them are in Prop 98 um, except state preschool. Um, so in addition to the federal funding that comes in, we have a lot of state funding. that, And this isn't necessarily, it's not like matching funding, but it's just the state funding that comes in. So um, there's not necessarily any kind of matching or uh, obligation for all of this in terms of how much state funding goes in. But we do see state funding that also goes into um, our CalWORKs programs, our CAP program, our general child care program. Some, some state funding goes into CSPP programs. And then, you know, our, our CMIG, our QCC funding, uh, all of that funding comes out of general fund that's non-Prop 98. So um, if we get like food program dollars, much of the supportive services that come out through CDSS or general fund, non-Prop 98 dollars, unless they're going to state preschool programs, then they may be Prop 98 um, funded. So some of these um, are regulated by CDE. Some of these are regulated by CDSS, that, some of that state funding. So it really depends on um, the programmatic areas. If it's state preschool, transitional kindergarten, if it's connected there, it, if it's Prop 98, then it's regulated by the California Department of Education. The, the CalWORKs part of the programs, the CAP program, um, general child care programs, migrant programs, um, R and R, uh, LPC. The, those are coming out of CDSS, and those funds are regulated by CDSS. 
James, um, I'm going to stop you just for one second. We had a question um, of where the funding comes from for special education. Do maybe you and Nina know? Um, yeah, we may want to um, let Denise, I mean, we'll surely want Nina to weigh in on this. I Special ed funding, I think a lot of that comes in through title, I think it's called title one funds. Um, to my knowledge, m most of that is all CDE uh, regulated and funded when it comes down. But that's something that I'm not 100% sure about. So if Nina knows, great. If not, um, I'll need to look into that a little bit and then we can we can send everyone the answer to that. Nina, are, is that something? Yeah, yeah, familiar? you're you're absolutely right. It, correct. Um, there is um special education funds that does flow from the federal government. Um, like like Justina was saying, that slide only captures half of it. So there are additional pots. It only goes to school districts, and California accepts it basically as Title One funds. We also do have a number of other funds in the state of California that are specific California funds. Um, those also do go through school districts, um, ELOP funds, um, and some others also mainly go through school districts as well. And then we certainly do have um, a number of other funds um, which we utilize for factors and things like that in terms of the reimbursement system, which would be outside of any of those other fund systems. Um, all of those funds, as they do come through the state of California do get funneled through to the Department of Education. Um, even the funding um, for the young children also do get um, specifically funded through the Department of Education through their special education division. So there is a partnership between the early learning division and the special ed division in terms of making sure we process those. So hopefully that helps clarify a little bit. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Nina. Any are there any other questions, Justina, before we continue? No, we're good. Okay. So this next slide is just building off the, the, the previous slide a little bit. You know, we talked a little bit about the Prop 98 funding. This is a, a minimum funding requirement. Um K twelve, you know, K-12, it's typically looked at as K-12 funding, but Anything on the education side rolls into Prop 98. So TK is included in that, CSPP is included in that. And as I mentioned, um, the many of the <clears throat> supportive services that are funded for like state preschool or for TK, that's all comes out of Prop 98 as well. Um, uh, or it's part of Prop 98. So on the general fund side, just outlining a little bit of where where those general funds come from. So one of the biggest areas of, of our general funds come out of personal income taxes. And so if you follow uh, the budget or conversations around the budget, you'll hear often a lot about the projection, the projected revenue, right? And so because all of our revenue or comes from taxes, the, a, a lot of it is, is unknown. So some of it we may have a pretty good idea on. Property taxes are a little bit more stable. Um, corporate taxes might be a little bit more stable than personal income taxes. Those those tend to, to fluctuate. So we're dependent or have a, a great dependency, not fully dependent, but there's a great dependency on the general funds and what comes in out of taxes. So, so you'll often see the budget projections will change, right? We'll hear, um, you know, maybe early, we might hear that we are concerned we have a $30 million deficit or we have a $15 million excess we're projecting. But then the next quarter, um, the, the revenues come in, especially the folks that pay taxes, pay um, quarterly taxes um, ahead of filing income tax so that um, so that they diminish their uh, overall responsibility at the very end. So th those come in and they change the projections. And so sometimes it's really drastic. We might hear that we have we're concerned about a $10 million deficit and then, you know, three months comes by and now it's a $35 million deficit or the other way around. It could be um, an excess, but that, um, that, that, that happens pretty regularly. 
Um, and then the legislature can provide uh, more funding than the Prop 98 guarantees if they choose to do that. Um, that's an option that's available to them that they can they can provide that. Now, um, child care funding, what we wanted to do here was just, uh, we covered this a little more in detail if you were in the first uh, first part of the budget, but we wanted to talk a little bit about our child care funding um and a little bit about where where that comes from so we this is kind of just a a little bit more information about our child care funding and uh, the federal funds that come down how many children they're supporting nearly 40,000 children are supported with that funding so we have our federal funding source you know through um TANF block grant, we have the CCDVG funds. Um, also at the state level, there's a CCDVG state plan. And um, on, a, on a regular basis, every, you know, every three years, then the agency, the lead agency must submit a state plan. So they submit the state plan. Right now, CDSS is in the process of holding um, hearings throughout the state. I think their last one, I don't know the date off the top of my head. I, I, I just saw the emails, but it's a virtual. So it's a virtual session. It's intended to be the last session, but it's an opportunity for you to review what they're proposing. And um, it's like 100 pages of, of information um, um, that kind of walks you through um, their, their plan. But this this final opportunity, and Justina, um, if we can maybe make a note to get that out, I don't know if we've been getting that information out through Voices Network, um, but if not, we can do that and I can help you locate that. Um, I know that there is a state plan meeting tomorrow in Sacramento from 10 until noon, um, I believe. Okay. Um, so I will be there at that and I can um, provide some information on our resources page. I know they had one in Los Angeles and we have an ECE Voices lead that um, is attending that or has attended it. Um, so we're making sure that we have representation when um, they do have those hearings. OK. Yeah, and, and there's one in Fresno as well. And there will be a virtual one coming up um, for those who don't. Like you said, um, James, that will be the last one. And this is really an opportunity to hear what they're saying in the plan. And I know um, after that, there's the opportunity to provide written comment. So I know Every Child California will be providing written comment, which we'll be happy to share as well. Yeah, they can get so all the updates on the resources page. Yeah, and I they held a they held one of these sessions in Riverside uh, last week, and I attended that in Riverside. Um, so they kind of outline um, some of the key parts of their plan, and there's they they seek input. So when you go to if you go to one of the sessions, it is um, it's kind of scripted. They 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 have certain areas that they're really looking for some feedback specifically. So they're sharing what they are looking at and what their their thoughts are and then they're asking for feedback and input and so you have a really good opportunity in those areas to provide that and then they kind of have a a time at the end where you provide input related to the state plan and then as nina mentioned um you know if it does if you don't get a chance to bring it up in that two hour sessions then it's really um it's really critical that you consider weighing in in writing and you can submit those written plans. And I know many agencies and organizations, many of our membership agencies will submit a written response to the state plan and provide recommendations that we think need to be considered to um, provide the best possible opportunities for our field so that we can provide the best opportunities to children and families. Um, and we'll move into the next session, and this is more where we'll talk a little bit about um, kind of the the budget and what we've seen in the budget agreement. But what's what's transpired in the last two years now is that um, CCPU um, earned kind of bargaining rights for family child care providers. 
the challenge with this, I mean, this has been a real blessing overall. There's been a lot of benefit to this in a lot of ways, not only for child care, family child care providers who are the representation group for the, the union, but there's been uh, some some benefit for all of us as providers and all of us in the field. There's also been drawbacks to this as well. It's, it's, there's been pros and cons. So one of the real, one of the real challenges that is that often the governor, when we try to have conversations can come back and say, well, that needs to be taken up through the bargaining unit. Um, And there's some truth to that because the family child care piece of that does need to come through the family bargaining unit. But the other pieces don't necessarily need to come through the bargaining unit. But I think it's an opportunity. If if they want to delay something, it's an opportunity to delay it and create a little bit of delay. The, But I also think that that maybe some of their hope is that, hey, if we can if we can um, accomplish everything all together at one time, there's value and benefit in that. Um, so I, I don't know that it's always just to delay us, but sometimes that creates challenges because they they don't want to talk about something because they say that has to go through collective bargaining. And, uh, and that's not necessarily true, but that's how it's kind of been rolling out um, this way. So what you see on the screen now is some information about what we received in in the last budget um, related to our budget. So we really, we had a good year last year. The, there was a lot of work. Every Child California was a key co-sponsor for the reimbursement rate uh, bills, AB 596 and SB 380. That was both reimbursement rates and family fees. So those bills... Uh, those bills kind of are just sitting in limbo right now um, and will probably be repurposed in some manner or another be- because the primary uh, goals of those bills were met through the budget agreement. So, um, re- you know, a full reimbursement rate. So um, we had like $2.4, $2.5 billion in, towards the reimbursement rates and the family fees. And um, those will be rolled out over the next two years. We had an agreement from the governor to create a new uh, cost uh, cost structure for reimbursement of providers, which is looking at the cost of quality care. There is a lot of talk in the new state plan about how do we expedite payments to providers, um, how do we get payment to them more quickly to align with what uh, many private providers charge their private pay families up front? There's a lot of talk about how we consider a, 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 um, an approach on paying on enrollment rather than attendance. So that commitment to um, this new cost structure is critical. One of the things we'll see as a huge advocacy need on both the legislative side as well as uh, the budget side is to ensure that these agreements, these funding agreements that were agreed upon this year, that those get maintained and sustained over time, that we follow through. We have to continue to receive the funding in future years that allows us to continue to provide the services and meet the child and family counts that we're we're meeting right now. So that funding has to continue. Um, the, the cost structure, the family fee that uh, we've had several different statewide groups that have put a lot of work and effort into, into new cost structures, cost of quality care. So, but I, I, what, what I'm probably pretty certain will happen is that some of those will be reconvened as we really move uh, to create a brand new rate structure that hopefully will be um, will be something that works for all of us. I know there's other issues with that, um, you know, as we look for an alternative methodology and one single reimbursement rate system. Um, so some of the things you saw, some of those things in the budget, you know, we didn't uh, cost of living. Initially, we thought we were going to get a cost of living. We didn't get a cost of living. 
ultimately, as we got close to, to finalizing the budget, the cost of living was taken away from us. The money that would have went into a cost of living was put into toward reimbursement rates, family fees, and other things. So often you see those negotiations and those shifts that, okay, you want this, well, you you know, you can't get both. So there's a, there's a give and take. And so that's one of the things we saw. Um, some of the budget considerations, you know, we talked about federal funding, but we've, we've been in a little bit of a unique position in the last few years where we've had a lot of one-time federal funding. So we didn't really talk a lot about that tonight. We talked about the ongoing federal funding, but in recent years, we've had a lot of one-time federal funding, and that's what um, provided, you know, family fee waivers temporarily. That's what helped fund the hold harmless that uh, was so beneficial for providers. Um, it provided a lot of the stipends for providers to help them keep their doors open and stay afloat. So the with that money going away, this new alternative methodology, and for us ensuring that we advocate strongly to ensure that that new methodology is put into place and then that funding remains in place is critical. Um, I think that will end up being one of the priorities for our larger EC coalition, as well as for Every Child California. So that's something that you probably can expect to hear, um, hear and see more information about. Is that our last one? And then Q&A? Do we have any? Now we're on Q&A. So anyone who... Um, is on here with us. This is your chance to ask some questions. It's great that we have both James and Nina with us tonight. So you have two experts on advocacy, budget, legislation, ECE field. So take advantage of it and ask them some great questions. So I'm really new at this. And uh, it's more of a statement. I sat in, uh, I viewed the Board of Supervisors meeting for Santa Barbara County today. And one of the statistics they showed is that California uh, has a 30 billion with a B uh, deficit. Uh, and so I'm wondering, um, gosh, how does, how does that enter? It's the first time we've had this kind of a deficit in a really long time or a shortfall. How does that enter into all of this? So uh, Nina may have some inside information that she can share with us related to that. So I don't know, because, because the filing of taxes was extended, one, you know, we don't have all the tax returns in and, and finalized. They they haven't been uh they haven't been included in the in those budget projections. So unless I'm mistaken, that $30 billion. Um, estimate is is an estimate from from a few months ago. I don't think it's been updated. N Nina, am I? Is that correct? Or you're is you're you're correct. That is an estimate from um, a, a few weeks ago. They will not know um, since everything they're they're still collecting those lost tax revenues. So that's the projection. It is that was from the Department of Finance, not the Legislative Analyst Office. And they always have wildly different projections in terms of both how much surplus we have and also how much deficit we would be in. Um, so those are guesses really based on a point in time of what the revenue is. So we know it's certainly not going to be that drastic as to how much of a deficit it's going to be. Um, we're not entirely sure, but we will know much more in coming months. And I mean, Nina may have a little bit different perspective on this. I'm not the kind of a person that worries a lot, but I typically, when I hear information about the projections, I kind of take that with a grain of salt. You know, as Nina pointed out, you can have the Department of Finance gives you one number, the LAO gives you another number. They could be $20 million difference in the numbers. I mean, it can be very drastic. And I, I think sometimes it's better just to not, for me, it's better not to get caught up in that. Wait until we know for sure what what it is and what the what the budget proposal is. I think we're always trying to plan ahead, right? There's value in that so that we can kind of uh, strategically think about how we want to approach things. But the reality is 
that much of what we need to do, we we won't know until it really, that budget proposal really gets close to coming out or sometimes even until it's come out. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree with James and um, a lot of mentors uh, for with who've worked with me throughout the year say it's not our job to worry about the deficit and the funds. It's their job to figure out where the money is going to come from. Um, in terms of our pieces, we do have commitment through 2025. So at a minimum, we will be staying um, at the same levels. Um, all of these, again, wildly fluctuate by billions of dollars, you know, I mean, 20 billion, 30 billion differences we will see between projections. And again, there's going to be late tax filings. Um, if an IPO goes through, that completely changes everything. Uh, California has a very interesting way of making up money. We also do have an incredible rainy day fund as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to be tongue in cheek. I mean, just stuff happens in California that just does not happen in other states. And so um, I, I highly doubt that it's going to be that high. Um, for the past number of years, they have said we're heading towards a recession and the numbers keep coming in and the unemployment rate is still pretty low. And although we do see layoffs in certain industries, we do not in other industries. You know, housing market is still booming, constructions, et cetera. So um, I, I think I would do a wait and see as well. Um, there's folks who do some analysis and wonderful crunching. And we'll have a better idea in January. And I will guarantee you um, that even in January, the LAO and the Department of Finance are going to come out with two wildly different projection numbers as well. They never seem to agree on any of it. <laughs> and so, uh, Justine, you want to kind of cover what we have coming up and might be good also to share uh, help people rem remind them to get connected to your region's EC voices, because in addition to this state level work that Justina will talk about, um, many of the regions are starting to to do have regional activity, regional engagements with legislators that you can get uh, involved in and get connected to. Yes, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And like James said, we have this great new network called the ECE Voices the Educators Advocacy Network that we were able to put together with a grant we received from Practitioners Voice of California. Um, and in this group, it's completely free to join your network. We have 11 regions throughout California where you'll be assigned at least one uh, lead advocate, which is a mentor, which will be there for you um, to answer any questions you have about budget, legislation, and advocacy, and also um, tell you about opportunities to advocate at the Capitol or locally. A lot of these groups, like James said, are coming together for meet and greets to get to know each other and network, but also meet and greets where we're inviting your representatives to the location to meet with you and hear directly from you what you need for your programs and they're taking that back to the Capitol with them. Um, we are uh, January 24th looking to bring ECE Voices members to Sacramento. There's going to be an advocacy day that day um, and we'll come together with our ECE Voices gear, our t-shirts and everything to represent um, the ECE providers at the Capitol to meet with legislators along with other ECE coalition groups that'll be there that day as well. So we want to have a, a huge showing there and a show out to show them how important it is that these issues are being addressed. So we want to say thank you for what you've done. Please more is our stance right now. Um, I want to thank James for this very informative uh, presentation tonight. And Nina, thank you so much for jumping on and answering so many questions for us tonight. Again, this is all going to be available at the resource page. You'll receive an email after the training with a link to that page. It'll have this presentation, but also a PDF file with more in-depth information. It'll also have links to lots of different um, resources for you to look through. And I'll make sure and get the dates for the state plan meetings that are coming up so that you can join those. Um, if you don't have any other questions, I know it's getting kind of late and you're probably wanting to start your evening. So I will let you all go, but please feel free to email me at advocacy at everychildca.org. Thank you all. Bye all. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Justina. Great job. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate all your work on this. Thank you, Justina. Thanks, James. Thank you everyone for being here. Have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.